One of the most significant contemporary challenges of our time is the need to satisfy growing energy demand, while simultaneously reducing greenhouse gas emissions associated with the production, delivery and consumption of energy. How can our energy needs be better understood and accounted for across entire energy value chains and product life cycles? How can demand be met across all sectors efficiently and with more renewables? Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, and please allow me to add my own welcome to day two of the Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue 2022. It's great uh, to be back with you, and I know you've already gotten a great start with the minister's very thought-provoking keynotes, as well as the dialogue with Patricia Espinoza on the crucial link between the energy transition and climate protection. And now we want to continue straight away with the plenary looking at a key tool for doing both, for promoting the global Energiewende and also protecting the climate. Our focus is industry and decarbonization. And industry is, along with transportation, and I think uh, all of us uh, are aware of this, the fastest growing source of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. So if we're really serious about meeting or even exceeding our climate targets, we need to move faster to decarbonize the industry sector. And the task is especially complex. Firstly, because of links to other sectors such as transportation and power. And secondly, because of many industries' extended supply chains. What qualities are as, what qualifies as carbon neutral is by no means self-evident, of course, but depends on assessing the entire value chain of a product, a fuel, or a technology. And whether you're a policymaker, a manager, or an investor, you need to be able to weigh the overall environmental impact of different sources of energy in order to make informed decisions about how to channel financial flows and structure markets. So in this panel, we want to hear what the challenges look like in practice and ask what kind of tools and technologies policymakers and managers need as they move to decarbonize the industrial sector. It is a great pleasure to welcome our high-level panel. I will keep the introductions brief, as always, in order to maximize our time for discussion. And I begin here with Professor Benatou Zian. He is Algeria's Minister of the Energy Transition and Renewable Energy. Energies. He will be speaking to us in French. It's also a great pleasure to welcome Ruslan Kazapbayev. He is Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Kyrgyz Republic. Great to have you with us. Claude Turm is Minister for Energy, Minister for Spatial Planning for Luxembourg. Great to see you again. Welcome. Andrea Voigt is Head of Global Public Affairs at Danfoss Climate Solutions, Strategy and Sustainability. And it's a pleasure to welcome Kerstin André, who is Managing Director at the Federal Association of Energy and Water Management, Germany's biggest association of energy uh, companies. And let me just remind our audience that we are very eager to hear from you. You can use our digital tool to take part in our audience polls and or send us your questions and comments. And I would like to start with an audience poll, if I may. Here's our question. How to accelerate greenhouse gas reduction, gas emission reductions in the next decade? Set a high carbon price on imported goods. And uh, second choice, boost R&D on green hydrogen. Third choice, support innovation on sustainable fuels for shipping and air transport. Next choice, reduce emissions in road transport. And lastly, stricter and more transparent ESG accountability. So the numbers are shifting at the moment. I will let you keep on voting and we'll come back to the result in just a moment. Thank you so much, dear audience, for taking part in that audience poll. 
So I'd like to pick up on exactly the same question, how we can effectively decarbonize the industri industrial sector and ask all of you to talk about the main challenges you are facing in seeking to decarbonize industry. And given the complexity the, uh, that I just mentioned, how you can meet energy demand more efficiently while you, we are moving in that direction. And I will begin, if I may, with Minister Zian. Uh, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Excuse me, we speak with, uh, French language, um, but because my my English uh, my, my English is very bad. Uh, we just uh, uh, the bouleversement et structural à l'échelle mondiale et en Algérie. The structural changes at international level have also been seen here in Algeria. And this situation is a great challenge for us in Algeria. It is for this reason that we created a new ministry, a ministry for renewable energy and the energy transition. And it is the task of this ministry to create a, an ambitious program and to develop an ambitious strategy for 2030. And this strategy is about strengthening and promoting energy efficiency and saving energy. It is also aimed at expanding renewable energies and we also want to promote green hydrogen. This strategy is built on a huge potential here in Algeria. There's a lot of sunshine in our country and we also have the human resources necessary. We have water resources. There are desalination plants uh, which we've built over the past few years, and this is also important for our hydrogen strategy. Our main goal is to gradually phase out fossil fuel energy, which still constitutes a large part of Algeria's energy mix. We want to create a clean environment a more climate neutral and efficient energy supply and we also want to create an ecosystem that promotes innovation that allows us to create wealth and prosperity for our people we want to create sustainable jobs and strengthen resilience to to future crises de l'analyse de cycle de vie qui vise à quantifier we also launched life cycle assessments and analyzed the, the impact of certain life cycles on the environment. We also analyzed possibilities of recycling um, in the light of local specifics uh, regarding, uh, for example, the water scarcity in, in certain parts of Africa and also in the light of the costs and the potential profits. For example, I'd like to mention a, a project that was implemented to create uh, 15 uh, gigawatts this year and Beyond that, we also want to integrate the, the energy sector. Our focus here is also on cement production, recycling and water use. Another sec uh, example is the transportation sector. 
We want to promote the electrification of the transport sector and to, to use more LNG. So there's still fossil energy being used here, but we can manage to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. And, and uh, excuse me for uh, uh, not being able to speak in English here. If you wish, you can elaborate a bit later because I do want to talk about the poll results and they address some of the themes you mentioned. But let us go on now to uh, Minister Turmes and I'd like to also hear uh, what you see as the main challenges associated with decarbonizing industry given the complexity uh, of, the, of the situation. Um. I think we need, uh, first, is that we need a clear hierarchy on what is really important to move fast. And so it's about efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. It's about renewables, renewables, renewables. It's about direct electrification, direct electrification, direct electrification. Then it is about using waste heat from industry. Uh, it is using that in district heating systems which can replace gas, for example, in a residential area, and then comes hydrogen. So I think it's important that uh, with all respect to the need to move on green hydrogen, um, the next years that will not be as disposable, so we need to move fast on the other issues. And how do we do this in Luxembourg? So in Luxembourg, for example, our industry has an obligation to save every year 1.5% of their energy. Uh, they have to implement obligatory the audits uh, which they have to do and we have an obligation on the energy uh, companies, so on the gas and electricity companies, they also need to invest into energy efficiency, one and a half percent of their total sales. So we are organizing joint ventures between the energy business, who is knowledgeable about energy, who has longer uh, periods of payback, we see industry, and that's a very, very powerful instrument we have. Uh, and of course, we back this up with a national scheme on investment aid. So that's, uh, that's one. Uh, on the renewables, I think what is very important is uh, that we go now massively into uh, renewable long-term power purchase agreements. Um, and in order to help industry, but also the, uh, the, 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 the producers of renewables to do this matchmaking, there are two things which we have kicked off. One is at European Investment Bank, together with Commission, we are trying to get a de-risking for the uh, industry and the SMEs. And uh, we want to implement also what Norway has done. Norway has a good scheme where the, they have a, their, their uh, the export credit agency is insuring part of the deal which is made, for example, between a Norwegian wind operator or a hydro operator and an, and an industrial company. And that's very, very important that we move now fast also with these de-risking instruments so that we get uh, fast, uh, big uh, long-term PPAs. Could, and, can, I, can I just ask you to say a word for, for those who are perhaps just embarking on this journey, why is that important? Why is risk a bigger issue for SMEs in this area than perhaps for others? Yeah, I think so. if, I'm a, if I'm an industrial company, of course, the last 10 years, I had an advantage to be in the spot market. Now I'm penalized to be in the spot market. So if I have a long-term PPA, if, if somebody is doing offshore wind and he offers me a contract at, let's say, 65, then, of course, the industrialist, for example, ArcelorMittal in Luxembourg will say, okay, I get 65 now, but what if the spot market is back to 30 in, in, in three years? So, so you have to, you have also this kind of, of uh, basically hatching uh, possibilities which, uh, or instruments which the industry needs. Uh, and of course the off-taker will, will, of course, if you have an off-taker with Google, you, you will be optimistic because you, so Google will exist in, in five years or eight years or ten years. Because these long-term power purchase agreements will be eight, ten, twelve years. You cannot do it below. Um, and of course, but if, if a bunch of, let's say, 15 small and medium enterprises from Luxembourg show up with, uh, with an with a, uh, offshore wind company, then this offshore wind company will say, who are these guys? <laughs> Are they still existing in eight years? So, and this kind of risks makes these deals, these long-term PPAs, expensive. And therefore, you can have 
uh, financial instruments, and we are working with European Investment Bank, and we are also now working with the Luxembourgish uh, Export Credit Agency to do a Norwegian-style de-risking instrument in order to, to basically uh, speed up this matchmaking. And the last instrument is the new instrument which we got in December from Commissioner Vestager from, from DG Competition. We are now allowed for the first time in Europe to go beyond investment aid. We can also do operational aid. I will describe it. We have a glass company in Luxembourg. They use fossil hydrogen, which comes at a certain cost. If I now want this company to replace this by green hydrogen, there is a differential. And this differential is bigger. I can offer them for free the electrolyzer. They will not use the electrolyzer on site because the green hydrogen will be more expensive also because of the operational aid, uh, operational cost. So what we have now as an instrument is, and that is something which we used, especially in UK on the offshore wind, which is what we call contracts for difference. So uh, if the, this glass company uh, can now do a contract with our Ministry of Economy, and the deal is the following, uh, the differential cost between uh, green hydrogen and fossil hydrogen is X, and then you do a contract over 10 years, and the ministry will pay for the differential. And that instrument is now cleared by DG competition. Yeah. And so, uh, and because theoretically it would represent an undermining of state aid rules otherwise. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. B and and the, the beauty, and I'm really grateful to Commissioner Vestager, because until December, DG competition in Brussels, which is ruling all our state aid, was always strictly against all operation, operational aid. Now, for the first time, and we worked a lot with DG competition to make them understand, if we want industry to leapfrog into a zero carbon, uh, we need this operational aid. And now we have the instrument, and so just to wrap it up, what we now do in Luxembourg, we do a very detailed, sophisticated study with our uh, 60, 70 biggest industrialists. So cement industry, where are you now, where you have to go? Steel industry, where are you now, where you, do you have to go? Glass industry, where are you now, where you have to go? And that will be the basis then uh, to better understand what kind of contracts for difference you need or uh, there is areas like large industrial scale um, heat pumps where, where maybe okay. you do not need even, they, they are in the market, especially if you can link it with the long-term power purchase agreement, you do not need maybe this kind of contract for difference. So that's a bit what I think is Thank you. the most important instruments which we need to implement now. Thanks very much. And we're going to drill a bit deeper on some of those, but thanks for that very, very uh, comprehensive overview. Let me go now to Minister Kazakhbaev, and he will be speaking in Russia, so, Russian, so anyone who needs a headset, please get ready to, uh, to put it on. And we'll thank just you, give them uh, one, one moment, please, so that people can get ready for the translation. So please, go ahead, Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Прежде всего, я хотел бы выразить признательность федеральному министру иностранных дел Германии, своему коллеге, госпожа Анна-Лена Бербак. I would like to thank the German minister. I would like to thank Ms. Baerbock for the invitation to this international conference. And I would like to say that this conference, in the light of this situation, is, is very important over the past few years, industrialized nations have made very ambitious commitments to combating climate change and meeting global challenges, also regarding the pandemic and international political crises. We in, in Kyrgyzstan are on the path to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and in our country the, the share of Kyrgyzstan's share of emissions is, is only tiny. I would like to point out that 
supporting global commitments in the field of climate action and climate change mitigation is very important to us. Kyrgyzstan has renewed its commitment to ambitious climate targets. Also considering the possible international support, by 2030 we aim to reduce GHG emissions by 40 percent and under the condition that we receive international support. By 2050 we want to achieve greenhouse gas neutrality in the field of green technologies we also aim to take measures especially in the field of renewable energy this is a very topical issue given rising energy prices in terms of conventional energy this is very important Kyrgyzstan has great potential for renewable energy. Our hydroelectric power capacity is about 142 billion um, kilowatt hours and, and also solar energy is, is very prominent. The expansion of hydroelectric power stations is in line with the Paris Agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In this way, we also provide water to our neighboring countries, the countries that share rivers with us such as Tajikistan and we can create clean energy within the project Kaza 1000 it is an international energy project and we call on others to to invest together in hydroelectric power also in, in, in terms of public-private partnerships this is a great honor for me to, to take part in this discussion to support the green industry and to expand renewable energy. We have launched a, a program to support the green economy uh, and, uh, until 2023. We changed um, the, the tax scheme and improved the Investment Act in, in Kyrgyzstan to facilitate this, to enable additional measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and, and use renewable energies. We, we are taking measures to develop electric mobility. And, and, uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. And also in the field of tourism. Let me now come to the industry representatives on the panel and ask you also to talk about the main challenges that you see and how they can be, uh, how they can be dealt with. And uh, Andrea Voigt, if I can start with you. Heating and cooling, in fact, which is what Danfoss does, amount to a considerable share of the emissions, both in the industrial and overall in the energy and building sectors. Now, Danfoss, as I understand it, is currently running a campaign called Rethink Live to explore the heating and cooling industry in, uh, environment challenges and also potential smart solutions. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about both sides of the equation, the challenges, but also, of course, the solutions that you're looking at. Right. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, first of all, for inviting me to, to the panel. And then also about Danfoss. Heating and cooling is one part of what Danfoss is doing. It's also doing industrial hydraulics and also uh, electrification solutions for electrifications like frequency converters, for example. So it's, it's really three different uh, pillars that all come together in terms of uh, energy efficiency and enabling energy efficiency um, across the board, really. So, indeed, heating and cooling is one important part because it represents roughly half of the total final energy consumption in Europe and also globally. <clears throat> 
And we all know that, um, that energy consumption, unfortunately, is still based to a large extent on fossil fuels, which is why heating and cooling has really a key role to play if we want to achieve both um, the energy transition, but also the climate challenge and also the energy security challenge, which we are now all, all facing. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> So heating and cooling is not only buildings, uh, we, that's what you think probably first when you hear, hear heating and cooling, it's also of course industry, because heat and cold is also used a lot uh, in industry. And what really is very important in, in, in the overall picture, I think, is the tandem between renewable energies and energy efficiency. We need the energy efficiency in order to get to the renewable energies, and that is where the challenge lies, but also where we have a huge opportunity, I think. And that opportunity basically um, is, uh, relies on three different pillars, I would say. The first one would be to really optimize the energy flows. And there are a lot of opportunities to do so. That can be very simple opportunities in a building, for example, if you have a hydronic balancing to make sure that the temperature is everywhere the same at all floors and that it is regulated and not just factory set. It's a simple thing, it's a very short payback and it's really easy to implement. So that's one typical thing related to buildings. But then you can take it also much further and you can say, okay, let's use the power of digital. I haven't heard a lot of digital about digital today. We did it yesterday. <laughs> okay, sorry. I wasn't but it should yesterday. be in every panel. You're should quite be everywhere. Right. <laughs> because it brings huge opportunities, actually. The dit uh, digital solutions bring huge opportunities because they allow to, in real time, measure energy consumption to see what goes wrong, what goes right, where is energy needed, where can we perhaps switch it off. There is a lot of opportunities in that sense to reduce the energy use. And if you reduce the energy use, then you more easily switch to the renewables as well. So that's uh, a second part I wanted to mention. So optimizing the flows, use the power of digital. And the third one, which is probably the most important one, is to take a systemic perspective. So meaning that you don't look at the silos where you have an equipment or a device or an air conditioner or a heater or whatever it is, but where you really bring it together in a sort of district-based approach. And there you can say, okay, let's take district energy, let's look, where is heat available? Where do I need that heat and how can I bring it together? And that, unfortunately, today, and that comes to the challenge you were mentioning, that, unfortunately, today is not really done system systematically. You would have heat generated perhaps somewhere as a waste heat, for example, from an industrial process, for example, from a cooling process, and that heat is just yeah. going away. It's not used anywhere, but you could use that heat actually, feed it into a district energy network and use it elsewhere then. And that then reduces the need to generate heat on the other side. And that's certainly a very big advantage that we have and which is not at all used to its full extent today. So that's one. And if you combine this then with heat pumps, as Claude was saying earlier, if you combine it with heat pumps, then you can even make more out of that. You can bring more flexibility, you can bring thermal storage as well. And as we move to more and more renewables in the electricity system, we need more and more flexibility, we need more and more storage, because those energies, as we all know, are not stable, they are uh, intermittent. So whatever we can do in order to phase them in is a useful um, contribution to make the energy transition happen. So, so we do have a lot of opportunities there. What we need is to bring people around the table and make sure that those opportunities are being used. We need a mandatory energy planning, for example, that brings the different stakeholders around the table and that forces them to look, here is heat, here is it needed, how, bring it, how can I bring it together? I very much agree on the energy audits, implement the energy audit rec recommendations, not just give a recommendation, put it in your drawer and then move to the next thing. So implement them, make them happen, make them mandatory. That's another big thing uh, which I wanted to mention. And then I'm just looking. Um, and then uh, a third one which I wanted to mention as well is to really valorize um, the power of flexibility. If, if there is a way of providing flexibility, of making it easier to phase in the renewables, of providing storage, then this should be valorized in a business model so that people are incentivized to do it, that industry is incentivized to do it, not existing today. Yeah. So a lot of opportunities there. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, let me ask Kerstin Andre now, and as I mentioned, you do represent the biggest uh, energy industrial association in Germany, and clearly your members are facing a, a, a three-part challenge at least, energy security uh, in the current situation, then energy efficiency, uh, essentially also as a link to reducing uh, fossil fuel consumption, uh, particularly in the face of this crisis, and then thirdly, decarbonization. So where do you see uh, the biggest challenges that German industry is facing, and where do you see the most innovative solutions to approaching those challenges? Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for the invitation and um, discussing here this really um, major topic, because the, the current situation is really uh, sadful, and I think uh, we discuss many things uh, uh, currently all over the world, and we're discussing also um, what uh, what the uh, the, um, the 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 challenge uh, f um, to uh, how how can we set climate change and uh, the the challenge to uh, the, for the target uh, climate change set um, on the top of our agenda because at the moment we are discussing all uh, over the world, other things, but climate change must be on the top of the agenda. And we have to do both things, and that's the uh, point of this industrial uh, panel we have here. We have to do, um, at first, cut global CO2 emissions to zero, and on the, on the other hand, we have to transform our whole economy in a record time. And I think that's the problem. We are discussing not only the energy sector, we are discussing the whole economy. And the constraints to this is that we have an increasing energy demand of a developing and growing population all over the world. And this bring all together um, and these uh, to, to find solutions for this is very important and so I'm, I'm really convinced with discussions like this. We have a Paris Agreement and we have a lot of countries who are aligned with the Paris Agreement, that's a good situation. Uh, we know that global energy transition is based on renewables. That's also a good uh, situation, a good, uh, uh, a good issue. And um, our economy, and not only the German economy, a lot of economies are highly efficient. They are digital. That's really very important that we uh, put digitalization in these topics. And uh, we have a scientific a technology, a technological advances. So we have a lot of impact. We can bring a lot of impact in these uh, questions, and we need uh, to bring it all together. And Germany and the EU has set ambitious targets. And I think we have to consider this: these targets are not under discussion, also not in this situation. And maybe um, we get more in the act, uh, in, in, in the um, to, to, to reach uh, this target. So we have to consider that the energy vendor is a solution for, uh, for our problems. And um, as you mentioned in the beginning, we are talking about efficiency and we are talking about energy vendor. But for my association, I can say we are talking also about security of supply. And security of supply is a main, um, is, is really important for the acceptance for the energy vendor. Because if people don't believe that they are secure, that, they, that the supply is working, that their demand um, is, is, is filled, they don't accept the energy vendor. So what are the key consequences in the, uh, act, in, in the current situation? First of all, um, we constitute an huge opportunity to speed um, up important decisions. We have to get people, we have to get governments, we have to get uh, companies in action. Second, main investments in energy industries and energy um, uh, consuming industries go all in renewable energies, in renewable invests. Third, we have to reduce our dependencies on fossil fuels. That's not only in the uh, current situation. I think uh, we saw this in the last years. The dependency uh, from fossil fuels are too high, and so we need uh, to reduce this. And fourth, life cycle assessments of investments have taken all into account. 
And so for me, I think what uh, Claude said, uh, efficiency, renewable energy, that's all, all correct. And I, um, I'm really um, uh, convinced that this is so important. But on one point, I have another, um, I have another view. I think we need really um, a, 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 a holistic approach and a huge approach for hydrogen. I'm sure we need not only electrification, we need green molecules. We have a huge industry, we have a lot of companies, and um, we need green hydrogen based for their production, based their consumption. And so, and the, uh, my association um, is co-host from an um, ambassador's talk, we are talking about um, uh, hydrogen and green hydrogen. And so many countries all over the world are aligned with a hydrogen strategy. They have their own hydrogen strategy. And I think it's a great window of opportunity to, to force these strategies to come together to make partnerships uh, for hydrogen. So we need to further electrify our economies and at the same time ramping up a hydrogen-based economy. And this is for me really very important. Green electrons on the one hand, green hydrogen on the other hand. May I ask one follow-up question about that? Because we heard uh, Andrea talking about the need for comprehensive forward-looking energy planning. And we heard Minister Turm essentially saying the same. Whether companies use green hydrogen is going to depend partly on infrastructure decisions being made right now because of the long lead times for hydrogen. Are you satisfied with the way that the German government is, and, and the EU for that matter, are looking at this issue? Because of course we have the risk of lock-in if infrastructure decisions are made, for example, about uh, the electricity net, about the kind of transition uh, networks that we're building. Uh, as I understand it, the big industrial comp countries, companies in Germany are going to often be producing hydrogen on site. Yep. So they are going to need distribution networks that look different from the networks that we have today. Yes, I think that's really a, um, a main question, a very important question, because how can we bring the companies in the, in the right uh, production ma manners, how can we bring them in the right invest investments? And they need hydrogen and they need the decision now do we have enough hydrogen to switch in another production line? But we have not enough green hydrogen at the moment. Um, I think we are talking about 1% worldwide when I see it correctly. So we need, on the one hand, we need to ramp up green hydrogen. We need to ramp up renewables energies because green hydrogen is based on renewable energies. But we, we have also a discussion um, around uh, blue hydrogen and uh, turquoise hydrogen. The problem is, Blue hydrogen is based on natural gas. So we are discussing the question how long will we explore natural gas uh, as a basement as a, for uh, blue hydrogen that we can help the industries to um, make the right decisions for investments in their production lines. That's really a, a very difficult question. I think in the, in the end of all these discussions, we are uh, we are fine, we are all aligned that we need more renewable energies and we need to wrap up green hydrogen, um, but we need also a framework around hydrogen, not only from Germany, also from the EU, who makes this with a big approach, with, uh, with a holistic approach, who think big and to make this industry um, explorable and scalable, because I think it's really a... a pillar for our new energy system, hydrogen can be and we will need it. Thank you very much. We did do a whole panel on hydrogen yesterday. In fact, we did two yesterday. So I'm going to endeavor that we don't now only talk about hydrogen. What I do want to do <laughs> is drill deeper on the tools and technologies that all of you think would best facilitate industrial decarbonization going forward. And I'd like to go back to the results of our poll, if I may, so that we give the audience a chance to see what we're seeing here on the screen. And uh, 
hopefully uh, the audience uh, can, yes, here we go, get a look at that. So uh, the largest share does say boost R&D on green hydrogen, that's 33%, but 27% say set a high carbon price on imported goods. Interestingly enough, at the Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue, ladies and gentlemen, we used to always devote at least one panel entirely to the topic of a carbon price. It says a lot that we're not doing that uh, this year. Carbon price is often viewed as so difficult to achieve that nonetheless, here it is uh, at number two on our poll at 28% of the, of the vote. And then we have beyond that 19% saying we need stricter and more transparent ESG accountability. 15% want more focus on innovation in sustainable fuels for shipping and air transport, and 5% would like to see more efforts to reduce emissions in road transport, of course, that being part of that value chain uh, for industry. And I see Claude Turm has his mic all ready to go, so <laughs> please, uh, which tools and technologies, you started talking a little bit about this, but I have the sense that you also wanted to respond to what we've just heard from uh, Good, but Catherine. maybe first on why, why is there there may be less a need to discuss carbon pricing this year because Europe has a fully fledged uh, carbon uh, system which is robust, which even showed in this crisis to be robust, and Europe has decided on a border adjustment tax. So, so this is now on the table. So these things are, are done. But we're uh, not only in you, Europe here at no, the no, we are not only in Europe, <laughs> but, but uh, the European carbon border uh, adjustment will trigger a worldwide discussion because if China and US and, and others are not no more allowed to import their steel or, or only uh, allowed to import their steel uh, with a price tag on our markets, that, that will trigger a worldwide discussion. So maybe on, on green hydrogen, I'm, I think we need to speed this up and we need to do this big. And we, do, we need to do this in a coordinated way. So what I want is much more EU coordination of all these kind of uh, Habeck going there, uh, the Belgian minister going there. So that, that, is, that is nice. But I think what we need is we, a European strategy. And I said to the energy ministers three years ago when we had a discussion, should the oil market be in euro? I said the only market which could be in euro one day would be a global hydrogen market. If Europe is the first market to have a clear definition on what is green hydrogen, a certification scheme, and the second is that then we do behind maybe also de-risking instruments for the green hydrogen deals and, and with the European Investment Bank. And that is what we have to do uh, maybe uh, right now. And another thing is be aware that on the, in the Renewable Energy Directive, which is on the table, which we will finalize in June, uh, we have a proposal from Commission 50% of all fossil hydrogen should be replaced until 2030 by green hydrogen. But now the French presidency has proposed to postpone this to 35, which, is, which I think is a completely uh, counterproductive move because it, we need investment certainty. And the best certainty is an EU law where we say, look, 50% of the fossil hydrogen needs to re be replaced by, by green hydrogen, and that will allow Algeria, uh, for example, to immediately know if I have a green hydrogen production up and running in, in 25 or in 26 in, in, in Algeria, I will have clients in Europe which will have to replace their fossil hydrogen by green hydrogen. Thank you very much. And I want to go across the panel, ask you to respond to what you see on this uh, poll result and how that might apply to your particular situation. And we've got about 15 minutes left on the clock. So I'm asking if you would for really concise uh, responses on this. Uh, Minister Zian, uh, you mentioned it. Currently, the um, Algerian economy is highly uh, dependent still on fossil fuels, including in industry, of course. Uh, you do want to boost your relatively modest renewable share. Um, which of these uh, tools and technologies are the ones that you consider most promising to meet that challenge in the Algerian industrial sector? Oui, uh, merci pour la question. Justement, uh, je commence par... Thank you for this question. Well, first of all, I'd like to talk about the uh, capacity. 
By 2030, we can expand our, the, uh, this uh, about, uh, un until 60%. The program we have launched allows us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and this will allow us to save a lot of energy and, and a, a lot of emissions and the new program we have launched in Algeria is also aimed to save greenhouse gas emissions and we can also export further products and until this strategy has been fully implemented by 2037 we have an interim strategy which aims to promote hydrogen we are currently working on this interim strategy and I, I forgot to mention that uh, it is also important to expand electric mobility. The photovoltaic program is an another thing I'd like to mention. We want to launch with a, a thousand megawatts program. So there, we started an auctioning round here. And the idea is to create a transition until 2035. As I said, Algeria has a lot of sunshine at its disposal, a lot of human resources, and also a good investment environment. And therefore, we believe that we can embed this hydrogen strategy very well into our context. And we're now waiting for the concrete uh, steps to, to implement this. Algeria will also need um, further technical support and support also from Europe, but at the same time, we, we can also support Europe. The potential for trade in hydrogen from a solar-rich country like yours uh, into Europe with its, uh, its big industries. What do you need from Europe to really be able to expand your hydrogen no, industry in a reliable yeah. Fashion. Non, 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 rien. J'ai dit, j'ai dit actuellement, il y a d'abord la stratégie. Elle, elle est toujours théorique, mais nous nous projetons donc sur le développement de l'hydrogène. So, uh, there are now only theoretical strategies in place, but we want to place a major focus on on hydrogen. Donc, qui va combiner éventuellement au développement. Of course, we must combine hydrogen with solar energy, and we know that there will be a demand for hydrogen in Europe in the coming years, 2035, 2040. This is uh, uh, the framework, the time frame that we have set ourselves for hydrogen. And uh, we may be possible also to help cover uh, energy demand, uh, hydrogen demand in Europe. Merci. Um, let me go over to, um, to uh, Ms. Voigt and ask you also, if you take a look at uh, this list, are there things that you would add to that, or how do you see the priorities uh, that are reflected in our save survey? Yeah, I would rather say um, I'm not seeing <laughs> what I would like to see on, on the list, actually. And, and the discussion that we were just having is very symptomatic. There is a lot about um, hydrogen, green hydrogen, energy supply. I mean, this is, I'm not saying this is not important. This is extremely important, obviously, and we need all of the solutions in order to achieve the climate targets and the energy targets, that goes without saying. And there is room for everything as well. I think there is no silver bullet. Uh, it's a huge task, so that's very clear. But um, I think we also need a very strong focus on optimizing how we use energy. And that, I'm not seeing it there. And I think it's really, it would be really a missed opportunity if we spend all our time, energy, money on on 
just discussing how can we optimize the supply side. Let's also look at how can we optimize the demand side. And for the demand side, as I was saying earlier, we have a lot of technologies and tools that are immediately available that can be used tomorrow, where we don't have to have a big discussion on, on what needs to be done, how, and so on and so on. Just use what we have and use it now. Optimize the energy flows as we can, digitalize where we can, can use the power of the digitalization tools that we have, go into a district energy planning approach, use the synergies between them, use heat pumps to sort of make it more efficient. Loads of stuff around. So let's, let's make sure that we get the balance right here. Do you, and do you have a theory about why energy efficiency often does get neglected in the discussion? I was yesterday quoting uh, the latest leader from The Economist, which says that when we look at the energy security crisis, we're asking too little of citizens, says The Economist. Why aren't we talking about turning down thermostats, uh, uh, perhaps having driverless days as we did in the 70s, um, reducing speed limits? Uh, do you have a theory about why that's the case? And not only on the part of citizens, of course, on the part of industry as well. I think uh, it's something we've been facing, um, if I refer back to the Brussels bubble, we've been facing that for the past, I don't know how many years. It is, a, it is a complex issue and you can't sell it in inverted commas as easily as you can sell, for example, a solar panel or, or something visible. It's not yeah. visible as such. It's a lot of little things that come together and that make a difference. And if you take active energy efficiency, then it is really as I was saying, it's about regulating the energy flow. So how, how do you convey this in an easy, easily understandable way um, to, citizen, to citizens and also to policymakers? I think that's where the challenge lies. But I also think to be positive, um, it's getting much better. I mean, it's getting much more attention than it was getting, uh, I don't know, six, seven years ago. So, so it is very much improving, but uh, there is much room for improvement still. And really... Right. Getting the balance right is for me really the key, uh, the key word here. And I, can I, I just say, add 30 yeah. seconds on the issue of The Economist? Uh, sure. I think The Economist is not watching what 31 energy ministers from all over the world have decided last week in Paris at IEA. Last week in Paris, we decided to implement Fatih Birol's 10-point plan on gas, how to reduce gas in a hurry, and we, we will actively work on how to reduce the oil demand. And next week we have a coordination meeting where we do not only have governments, where we will invite C40, which is the biggest cities in the world who are active on climate change, where we invite Greenpeace, uh, transport and environment. So what we need, and I think it's the only way also on the short term to get out of the security of supply crisis. We need a broad societal agenda, uh, or, uh, alliance, which is much broader than governments. Businesses must be in, big cities must be in, and especially the cities, citizens must be in. And we are working on that in a coordinated way now, at least at European level, to get this up and running, this how to save oil and gas and electricity in a hurry. Thank you. Let me go to Minister Kazakh Bayev, please, uh, also for a short response. What you see here, which of these tools and technologies would be most meaningful for Kyrgyzstan as you seek to decarbonize your industry? Thank you. As I said, we place a major focus on renewable energies. I, I, I said so earlier. I said that our share of emissions is only 0.03%. This is a tiny uh, fraction. And Kyrgyzstan is very much interested in exploring the uh, possibilities of international cooperation um, to uh, for example, regarding ecological solutions for the cities and energy, energy efficiency, saving our resources. 90% of our country consists of mountains and water, but we only use 10% of the potential of our rivers. So we are keen to, to 
creates uh, further potential here in the field of renewable energy. And I, I have also said that solar energy and wind energy uh, and uh, using the rivers require technological innovation and we need more innovation as well as financial resources. And therefore, it is our main wish to, to expand these areas, uh, and mainly together with our European partners and, 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 and Germany. Thank you. And ask you to just, again, uh, take us through of these various tools that are listed here. Uh, if we look at those in comparison to uh, Germany's current plan for industrial transformation, uh, it has earmarked 200 billion euros uh, for that purpose between now and 2026. And it does include, of course, uh, things like I improving R&D and uh, even uh, piloting uh, on hydrogen, uh, expansion of the electric vehicle charging network. Uh, how do you think that money should be spent to maximum positive effect and what's missing for you on, on that list? Uh, yes, um, these 200 uh, billion euro are very, very important for the industry and for the um, for the investments and that we, uh, go, that, that we knew where we have to go. And as I said, uh, the industry is really aligned with um, uh, renewable energy, with energy vendor, with um, green hydrogen. Um, and so for me, it's uh, this choice. I understand that we need a boost in RNG on green hydrogen. Um, but I fully agree that the demand side and the efficiency must be on the table. And th we have to discuss this also. Um, so you are really uh, right when you are talking about flexibility and how can we use flexibility and what can we do in the industrial uh, companies, in the, in, in the industry to reduce the demand. But I think we have to consider that demand grow. And that's one of the biggest problems we have. On the one side, we have to cut CO2 emissions, we have to uh, change the industry in a sustainable industry and we have a growing demand. In Germany, uh, so... A growing demand worldwide, but worldwide. not in Europe. Oh, no, no, yeah, yeah, a growing demand worldwide. And in Europe, we have a growing demand on power. So we need more renewable energy. not on energies, energy, because on, on energy, energy, it's going on down power, in Europe. Really, yeah. on power, in, 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 in uh, demand and power. So in Germany, um, if, uh, in the last two years, uh, the, or the, the old uh, government says that we have 585 terawatt uh, hours uh, from power demand. Now we are talking about more than 700. What does it mean? It means that we need more renewable energy, because this power has to be based on renewable energy. In Germany, we have big problems with permissions, we have problems with space, we have problems with uh, projects that we can realize. And that's not only a German problem, that's a, a problem all over the world and especially in the European Union. So we, have a com we need a commitment that the boost of renewable energies needs to put in action all the governments, to put in action the, 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 the companies and also the communities, the, cit the citizens, that we have to phase in a new world with a new energy uh, supply based on renewable energies. That's, for me, the most important point. Uh, and That's we will the, do it. the moonshot, no, no, the moonshot we, theory. No, no, and we will do it in the, the Renewable Energy Directive, which is on the table, has a new amendment, which was proposed by Luxembourg, uh, Germany and Denmark, which says renewable, uh, renewable investments will be considered as an investment of general interest. And that's very, and very that, important. And yeah. that helps then to balance also when it comes to the, 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 the equilibrium we have to find with biodiversity. So that Tell us what that means, because for those who are not EU members, just tell us what the significance is of that. So, so uh, the EU directive is a law which every EU country has to apply. And in that law, we will now say that uh, a renewable energy investment is an investment of general interest. And that gives it a higher status than, 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 than other interests in society. And that will allow us to speed up authorizations. And the second thing we will do in that law, and that's there I still have a bit to move also the German friends, which is we have to do it cross-border. Um, mm -hmm. We need a big uh, and fast rollout of offshore wind in the North Sea. You cannot do it in national borders. You have to do it for the whole basin. You have to do it for Baltic Sea, 
also on the, so th that's so it must be faster in authorizations and it must be more cross border you that were you important. were undoubtedly with us yesterday when we heard robert havick talk about planning and when we, and and permitting and the need for major change there and when we heard uh, minister Baerbach say no energy vendor can be accomplished nationally it is always a cooperative endeavor let me go now to <laughs> andrea foyt for a last word please yeah i just wanted to say i totally agree with what you were saying it's uh, i think as we move to more renewables we need we definitely need this flexibility and the storage solutions and everything which was just mentioned. I think that is the, the, the really the systems approach, what I was mentioning earlier. It is about making sure that we bring these two together and that we provide the sort of um, tools and opportunities in order to phase in those renewables in the most cost-effective way. And that's where the de demand side plays a role because that's where you can provide those opportunities to bring the renewables in a cost-efficient way into the system. Thank you. Thank you very, very much to all of you for being with us here for this panel on decarbonizing industry.